Welcome, welcome to the Shalom Kaysen Show. And today we're talking about a short history of the Catholic Church in Africa. But we're going to start with a prayer, a sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, the Catholic Church in Af Africa is part of the worldwide Catholic Church in full communion with the Holy See in Rome. Christian activity in Africa began in the first century when the Patriarchate of Alexandria in Egypt was formed as one of the four original patriarchs of the East, the others being Constantinople, Antioch, and Jerusalem. And we heard about Antioch and Jerusalem from the Bible. Okay, however, the Islamic conquest in the 7th century resulted in a harsh decline for Christianity in Northern Africa. Yet, at least outside the Islamic majority parts of Northern Africa, the presence of the Catholic Church has recovered and grown in the modern era in Africa as a whole. One of the reasons being the, the French colonization of several countries in Africa. And of course, the French people at the time were Catholic. I mean, there, uh, there's still a lot of Catholics in France, but it's more of a secular country now. Um, Catholic church membership rose from 2 million in 1900 to 140 million in 2000, which is an insane increase. That's like a hundredfold increase in 100 years. In 2005, the Catholic Church in Africa, including Eastern Catholic churches, uh, embraced approximately 135 million of the 809 million people in Africa. In 2009, when Pope Benedict XVI visited Africa, it was estimated at 158 million Catholics in Africa. Most belong to the Latin Church, but there are also millions of members of the Eastern Catholic Churches. By 2025, one-sixth or 230 million of the world's Catholics are expected to be Africans. So that's pretty interesting. The world's largest seminary is in Nigeria. Bet you didn't know that. And it borders Cameroon in Western Africa, and Africa produces a large percentage of the world's priests. As of, and this is a funny thing that I just want to add, which is a personal anecdote. I've been to many parishes here in the U.S. with African priests as pastors, like not African American. I'm talking African from Ghana or Cameroon or Nigeria or somewhere. They, you know, they have a thick African accent. Not, nothing wrong with having an accent, but I'm making the point that. These priests are missionaries from Africa getting sent over here to the U.S. because there aren't enough priests in the U.S. In fact, where I live in Virginia, there is an African priest in a parish, not, I mean, the parish where my kids go to school. So, yeah, the Af there's so many priests in Africa that they have extra to send over here to the United States. Okay. So as of June 26, 2020, there are also 29 cardinals. From Africa, and a cardinal is a leading bishop and prince of the Catholic Church, um, and and that's out of 222. So 10 percent of the cardinals are a um, African. Excuse me, 400,000 catechists, and that means people who um, teach religious education. Cardinal Peter Turkson, formerly Archbishop of Cape Coast, Ghana, is Africa's youngest cardinal at 64 years old and was also one of several prelates from Africa estimated as Papa Beale for the papacy in the last papal conclave of 2013. And Papa Beale is an official term uh, which is used to describe someone who is a possible candidate for the papacy. So he was actually considered for the papacy in 2013, the same time they were considering Pope Francis. So let's go a little bit more into the history of the church in Africa. Many important members of the early church were from Africa, including Mark the Evangelist, Origen, Tertullian, St. Augustine of Hippo, and I'm going to do a biography on St. Augustine of Hippo. He was of Berber descent, and Berbers are very dark uh, black people from northern Africa. You can see in this picture here he is drawn uh, very light-skinned, uh, European-looking, but he is he was very likely much darker than that because it doesn't say that he was mixed European and whatever. It says that he was Berber, so he was much likely much darker. And I, he's actually my confirmation saint and baptismal saint, St. Saint Augustine, 
because I didn't know. And when I looked it up, I'm like, wow, he's from North Africa. He's, you know, we have some kind of connection there. Okay. So, um, yeah, so he was from what is modern day Algeria. Clement of Alexandria, who was also from uh, Africa. Churches in Eastern North Africa, such as those in Egypt and Ethiopia, tend to align with the practice of Eastern Christianity. But those to the West, the area now known as the Maghreb, generally were more Western in practice. So the Maghreb, as you can see in this picture, if you're watching a video, is this uh, Western and kind of Western and Northern portion of Africa. And they do, they practice more of Latin Catholicism. Three early popes were, fa were from the Roman Africa province province, Pope Victor I, Pope Militates, and Pope Gelatius I. I'm going to do biographies on all these popes, and I'm going to be doing a lot more uh, African saint biographies, so stay tuned for that, and you can check out anything else I'm doing over at sdcason.com. That's my website, which has all the links and different tabs for everything, and it's very organized, unlike if you're on YouTube or somewhere else. It's not perfectly organized because it's their system. On my system, I have everything organized with menu tabs. You can go look at biographies, history, and things like that. So moving on, Islamic conquest and rule. Archaeological and scholarly research has shown that Christianity existed after the Muslim conquest, though the Catholic Church gradually declined along with the local Latin dialect. Many causes have been seen as to leading to the decline of Christianity in Maghreb. One of them is the constant wars and conquests as well as persecutions by, uh, by Muslims. In addition, many Christians also migrated to Europe. The church at the time lacked the backbone of a monastic tradition and was still suffering from the aftermath of heresies, including the so-called Donatist heresy, and that this contributed to the early obliteration of the church in the present-day Maghreb. Some historians contrast this with the strong monastic tradition in Coptic Egypt, which is credited as a factor that allowed the Coptic church to remain the majority faith in that country until around after the 14th century, despite numerous persecutions. In addition, the Romans and the Byzantines were unable to completely assimilate the indigenous peoples like the Berbers, who um, Augustine of Hippo was one of. So the problems we had with Christianity not surviving in Africa was that there wasn't a robust monastic tradition. And monasticism is just a way of living as a Christian in a group with other men. So these men would dedicate their lives to upholding the Christian faith, to um, copying books, of spiritual books and the Bible and things like that. And so without monks, basically, the and once the Muslims came in, the Christianity in the area just fell apart. But and we have a good source that it would have been different if there were more monks right here, because it says there was a strong monastic tradition in Coptic Egypt. And that's why the Coptic church remained the majority faith until around the 14th century, even though they had the same persecutions that other Africans had. OK, moving on. Another view is that Christianity in North Africa ended soon after conquest of North Africa by the Islamic Umayyad Caliphate between AD 647 and 709. However, new scholarship has appeared that disputes this. There are reports that Christianity persisted in the region from Tri Tripolitania, present day Western Libya, to present day Morocco for several centuries after the completion of the Arab conquest by 700. A Christian community is recorded in 1114 in Kala in central Algeria. There is also evidence of religious pilgrimages after 850 to the tombs of Christian saints outside of the city of Carthage and evidence of religious contact with Christians of Arab Spain. In addition, calendrical reforms adopted in Europe at this time were disseminated amongst the indigenous Christians of Tunis, which would have not been possible had there been an absence of contact with Rome. Local Catholicism came under pressure when the Muslim fundamentalist regimes of Almoravids and especially the Almohads came into power, and the record shows persecution and demands made that the local Christians of Tunis to convert to Islam. We still have reports of Christian inhabitants and a bishop in the city of Cairoan around 1150, a significant report since this city was founded by Arab Muslims 
around 680 as their administrative center after their conquest. A letter from the 14th century shows that there were then still four bishoprics left in North Africa, albeit a sharp decline from the over 400 bishoprics in existence at the time of the Arab conquest. So basically, before the Arabs came in, there were 400 bishoprics. Basically, a bishopric is what like we call now a diocese, a place where a bishop is in charge of a certain area. In some churches, uh, in some Protestant denominations, a bishop is just in charge of one church. That's not how it is in Catholicism. So in Catholicism, a bishop is in charge of multiple churches. He does, he celebrates the liturgy at one particular church from time to time, but he is in charge of maybe 20 or 100 churches. So think about this. Before the Muslims came in and conquered much of Africa, there were 400 bishoprics, which means let's say each bishop had a hundred or let's say each bishop had 10 churches. That's 4,000 churches just in the small area of North Africa. We're not talking about all of Africa. That's just in North Africa. And there could have been many, many more churches under each bishop. After the Muslims came in and took over, there were four, four bishoprics. Okay. So that's how much the devastation of the Muslim conquest was to Christianity. Berber Christians continued to live in Tunis and Nezawa in the south of Tunisia until the early 15th century. And in the first quarter of the 15th century, we even read that the native Christians of Tunis, though much assimilated, extended their church, perhaps because the last of the persecuted Christians from all over the Maghreb had gathered there. They were not in communion with the Catholic Church of that time, however. Another group of Christians who came to North Africa after being deported from Islamic Spain were called the Mozarabic. They were recognized as forming the Moroccan church by Pope Innocent IV. Christians in Morocco had mostly become slaves by the time of Ibn al-Amar and Ferdinand III of Castile. And this is around the um, 13th century, so like 1230s, and Ibn al-Amar was around the same time. He was the... Um, first ruler of the Emirate of Granada, which it was an independent, independent Muslim state on the Iberian Peninsula, which is also around Spain. And Ferdinand III was the king of Castile uh, around that time. So Celestine III had told Toledo's Archbishop Martin to dispatch a priest for Christians in Morocco. Innocent III in 1198 requested the Almohads to allow the Trinitarian order to perform its duties and in around 1200 wrote a letter to the Christians enslaved there. Rebel Castilians had also served the Almohad Caliphs and resided in Morocco. Pope Honorius III had requested the Almohads to allow the Christians to freely practice their faith. So we have a lot of history, a lot of letters written, a lot of notes back and forth and demands back and forth of people saying, hey, let the Christians worship freely. Let our brothers and sisters in the faith live out their faith. Don't make them slaves and tell them they can't practice their religion. This is going on all throughout. So some people say Christianity just totally disappeared. But as historians study more and more, they're finding evidence that it never tr completely went away, although it was devastated by the invasion of the Muslims, it never completely went away. In June of 1225, Honoris III issued the bull Vinae Domini Custodis that permitted two friars of the Dominican order named Dominic and Martin to establish a mission in Morocco and look after the affairs of Christians there. The friars of Francis of Assisi were dispatched to Morocco to evangelize to the Muslims but were killed. And that is unfortunate. And it was St. Daniel and compa companions who were venerated as martyrs, uh, they were killed in Cueta. So Honorius III on February 20th of 1226 told Rodrigo Jimenez de Rada to dispatch Franciscans to convert the Moroccan Muslims. The mission had proved very difficult due to the fact that Christianity was widely dispersed in the region. The first known bishop of Morocco was appointed by Pope Gregory IX on the 12th of June in 1237. The Sultan Abd al-Wahid II in 1233 1233 received a letter from the Pope referring to Bishop Agnello as the Bishop of Fez. Lope Fernandez de Ain was appointed as the Bishop of Morocco but wasn't able to establish himself before the Marinids captured Fez in 1248. Innocent IV had named him Bishop 
of Church of Africa on the 19th of December of 1246. The medieval Moroccan historian Ibn, Ibn Abizar stated that the Almohad Caliph Abu Ala Idris al Mamun had built a church in Marrakesh for the Christians to freely practice their faith at Fernando III's insistence. So it was, um, so Fernando was, if I'm not mistaken, he was in charge of, he was a bishop or something. I could be mistaken, but he was insisting that Christians be allowed to worship. So apparently the caliph, who is a leader of an area, uh, a caliphate, which is an area of Muslim rule, built a church for them. So that's interesting. But there's always this really angry relationship between the Muslims and Christians that we re really still have to this day, especially in Muslim majority areas. There are still killings going on of Christians and they are being kind of they're being, I'm looking for the right word here. They're being persecuted uh, severely in Africa to this very day, mostly in Eastern Africa, Horn of Africa area, but it does still go on. So Innocent IV asked emirs of Tunis, Cueta, and Bugia to permit Lope and Franciscan friars to look after the Christians in those regions. He thanked the Caliph Al Said for granting protection to the Christians and requested to allow them to create fortresses along the shores, but the Caliph rejected this request. Of course, he's going to reject that the Christians can have a fortress. That's not going to be good for him. If he decides to persecute them more, he has to deal with the fortress versus if they don't have as a big place like that that is very well built and protected he can just go in and do what he wants garcia perez was the archdeacon of morocco during the 1250s but the local church was unable to support him and he had to depend on the castilian church before the portuguese conquest of cueta uh, which is a spanish autonomous city on the north coast of africa franciscans were established there a document dated march 10th of 1413 shows that the anti-pope John XXIII had chosen Aymeri de Arilac as the Bishop of Morocco in place of Fray Diego de Jerez. And we're going to go into anti-popes and the Western Schism and all that much later on. If you want to check out church history, go to sdcason.com. On the menu, you will see history. Click that tab. We're only in the still in about the year 100 but we're going to get to the year 1400 we're going to get all the way to the year 2020 which is this current year at this recording lord willing you just got to be patient but you can check out the first four episodes which are up right now and a new episode will be coming out very soon let's talk about the modern era another phase of christianity in africa began with the arrival of portuguese in the 15th century after the end of reconquista which was a period in the history of the Iberian Peninsula of about 780 years between the Umayyad conquest of Hispania and the expansion of Christian kingdoms through Hispania and the fall of the Nazareth kingdom in Granada. So the Reconquista was basically the Spanish people were fighting the Muslims for like 700 years, trying to kick them out of Spain. And eventually they were successful. So after the end of the Reconquista, the Christian Portuguese and Spanish captured many ports in North Africa. The bishopric of Marrakesh continued to exist until the late 16th century and was born by the suffragans of Seville. Juan de Prado, who had attempted to reestablish the mission, was killed in 1631. A Franciscan monastery built in 1637 was destroyed in 1659 after the downfall of Sa'adi dynasty, which was an Arab Moroccan Sharifian dynasty, which ruled Morocco from 1549 to 1659 so for about 100 years. A small Franciscan chapel and monastery in the Mela of the city existed until the 18th century. The growth of Catholicism in the region after the French conquest was built on European colonizers and settlers, and these immigrants and most of their descendants left when the countries of the region became in independent. The Latin church remains the largest throughout the continent. However, in Eastern Africa, there has been an emergence of Alexandrian Rite, Eastern Catholic churches, the Coptic Catholic church, the Ethiopian Catholic Church, and the Eritrean Catholic Church. So all these churches, well, really we shouldn't say churches, we should say rites, because rite it means that you are a part of a larger organization. Church means you're your own. 
So actually we have an Alexandrian rite, Eastern Catholic rite, Coptic rite, Ethiopian rite, and Eritrean rite, R-I-T-E, rite meaning that this is the way you celebrate the liturgy. liturgy. Church means you're a separate entity. So really there's only, this needs to be edited to say Latin rite, <laughs> Eastern Catholic rite, Coptic rite, um, because rite means the way you celebrate the liturgy. Church, the Catholic church, is all the churches that include, that are underneath the universal banner of Catholic. Okay, Catholic monarchs. Despite prevalent Republican governments in contemporary time, Africa has a tradition of Catholic monarchs, such as the kingdoms of Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. And I did not know. I had no idea about that. Now we're going to talk about, um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about modern African papabili. In 1920, Hilaire Belloc had proclaimed, the church is Europe and Europe is the church. However, according to Philip Jenkins, the 20th century saw major changes for the Catholic church. By 1960, the College of Cardinals had its first sub-Saharan African, um, Lorian Rugamboa, and I'm sorry if I butchered this name, Lorian Rugamboa, and he was one of the, uh, he was the first sub-Saharan African cardinal. By deliberate policy, John Paul II, who is now Pope St. John Paul II, selected many cardinals from third world nations. And by 2001, they made up over 40% of the cardinals. In 2002, Italian cardinals made up just 15% of the college, a drop from 60% in the 1950s. So it was a deliberate policy of Pope St. John Paul II to fill the College of Cardinals with more people from more various places to make the College of Cardinals look more like the people in the universal church. There's people all over the world who are Catholic, and he wanted to show that by choosing the Cardinals in like. Uh, Jenkins saw the conservatism of Pope John Paul II as particularly attractive to Catholics in developing nations and likely to be a dominant force in Catholic politics for some time. Francis Arenze, who I'm definitely going to do a biography on this uh, very holy man. Francis Arenze is a Nigerian cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church. He is just amazing. Going to be doing a biography on him sometime soon. But anyway, Francis Arenze, a Nigerian cardinal and advisor to Pope St. John Paul II, was considered Papa Bile, which is an official term that says somebody could potentially be a pope. Before the 2005 papal enclave, which elected Pope Benedict XVI, who is Pope Emeritus Benedict at this time because he retired and his real name is, well, I don't want to say real name, but his birth name was um, Joseph Ratzinger, I believe. Let me look it up. I know it's Ratzinger, but I don't know if it's, yeah, Joseph Ratzinger. I was right. Okay, as Arenze was considered theologically conservative, Jenkins suggested he would have brought African, quote, notions of authority and charisma, unquote, to the office rather than democracy. Jenkins stated, quote, the prospect of a black African pope understandably excites Christians of all political persuasions, unquote. It excites me. There's another person who is Papa Bile, and that person is... Um, I believe he's a cardinal or not. I'm not sure, but Robert Seurat, and he is excellent as well. And he is Papa Bile. Maybe I'm saying it right. Is it Papa Bile or Papa Bile? Maybe they have a here. Pa, pe, pa, Bile. Yeah. Pope or Popable. Papa Bile. <laughs> That's a funny word. Papa Bile. So, it would be so exciting to have a black African Pope. I mean, that would be wonderful. To, we've had it in the past, but it's been so long. It's been thousands of years since then. Or even an Asian Pope. That would be cool, too. Um, any, You know, just anybody that's not European or doesn't have European ancestry. Nothing against Europeans, but we've had hundreds of European Popes. And it would be nice to have a black or, or an Asian or some other kind of Pope. That would be really cool. Just saying. Even Cardinal, Rat, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, three years before his own selection as Pope, labeled the prospect of an African Pope as, quote, entirely plausible and a, quote, wonderful sign for all Christianity, unquote. I absolutely agree. 
According to the Financial Times, an African such as Arinze would boost the popularity of the church, which is facing strong competition in Africa from Pentecostal, Baptist, and Evangelical denominations. So there's lots of Christians in Africa, tons of Christians, not just Catholics, uh, and they're all kind of battling to see who's going to have the most converts. And I think that's an awesome thing that Africans are really excited about the message of Jesus Christ once again. And it was unfortunate that so many years, hundreds and thousands of years had to pass where Christianity was being um, suppressed by the Muslims. That's not the I mean, it is still going on, but it's not widespread that Christianity is being suppressed anymore. So there's lots of Christians trying to convert. And I think it's awesome. The Daily Telegraph has said that an African papacy is the logical outcome, given that the majority of Catholics now live in the developing world. And in particular, the Catholic Church in Africa has grown by 20 times since 1980. In the papal conclave of 2013, Cardinal was called the most likely candidate from Africa and was considered the favorite to win the papacy before the election of Jorge Mario Bergoglio, who is also known as Pope Francis in 2013. Furthermore, Cardinal Robert Seurat, which I just talked about, this is my guy right here, I, I gotta do a biography on him too soon, has mentioned in the press as a possible candidate for the papacy both in 2013 and in future conclaves. So let's talk about issues. Um, Islamic persecution. Persecution of Christians by Islamists such as Boko Haram in Nigeria remains one of the hardest issues to solve for the Catholic Church in Africa, and it is going on to this very day, and it is very, very sad. Boko Haram has killed many, many Christians in Nigeria and other neighboring countries, and it just doesn't stop. The government is having a hard time dealing with them, and it's just, it's just a sad state of life for those Christians, so please pray for them when you get a chance. Although Catholic priestly vow uh, celibacy is a general challenge for all priests in the Catholic Church, for instance, because of cultural expectations for a man to have a family, Africa presents particular problems in the subject. Early in the 21st century, as celibacy continued to come under question, Africa was cited as a region where the violation of celibacy is particularly rampant. Priests on the continent were accused of taking wives and in an isolation of priests working in rural Africa and the low status of women is said to add to the temptation. A breakaway sect of married previously Catholic priests in Uganda called the Catholic Apostolic National Church formed in 2010 following the excommunication of a married priest by Pope Benedict XVI. And that's it, a short history of the Catholic Church in Africa. I hope you learned something. And um, what can we learn from history? So uh, let's do a quick summary. So basically the Catholic Church in Africa started right away right and you can read it in the gospels we actually had some of the evangelists going to africa we had an ethiopian in the gospel it wasn't the gospel in the book of acts becoming baptized becoming a christian taking that over there so we have christianity in africa from the very beginning in the bible it went on for a few hundred years until the roman empire fell apart about the seventh century the Islamic conquest happened when the Muslims came in and took over. They suppressed Christianity and persecuted Christians for thousands of, not thousands, I can't say, for about a thousand years. And then the colonizers came in, French colonizers, Dutch, other things like that. Germans came into Africa and they kicked out, I don't want to say kicked out, but they pushed back a lot of the Islamic conquest and then they brought Christianity back at that time. And from that time forward, Christianity has started to flourish more and more in the church. And the Catholic Church has been very responsive to this with Pope St. John Paul II uh, making many, many more cardinals, bishops, and other leaders in the church African. So we have lots of leaders in the church who are African, lots of cardinals and things like that. So what can we learn? So I need to pull up my little chart here, which is the moral virtues chart and i need to take my comment off as you can see here we have the moral virtues of prudence justice temperance and fortitude this is how we should live our lives and what can we learn from the short history of the catholic church in africa how can we live our lives better well i would say that there is prudence involved here so let's zoom in to prudence 
Prudence is always moving towards virtue and away from vice. And why is this important? So we have to have prudence to uh, the, no, I'm sorry, not prudence. Fortitude is what I meant to bring up. Fortitude is being brave during difficulties. Christians in Africa, a lot of people thought that they just disappeared. They just disappeared. Everybody converted to Islam and all the Christians went to other places. That's not actually what happened. Christianity in Africa was there the whole time. It got smaller and smaller and smaller, and they kept getting persecuted over and over and over, but they persevered. And perseverance, as you can see here, is part of fortitude, being brave during difficult circumstances. And we can be brave. We need to remember that the our blessed Lord told us that we would have to suffer. We would have to carry our cross. We need to have fortitude. Something like this can happen at any time. It's not just past. It's not just history. So be prepared with prayer and fasting for any type of persecution that might arise. And please have fortitude asked God to give you more fortitude. And that is it for the Shalom Kaysen show. We're going to sign off with a quick prayer. And then, yeah, I'll see you in a few minutes because I'm going to put up another show. I'm putting up a biography. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, God bless and stay holy, my friends. Peace out.